with you lot. Hello again everyone and welcome to another history related animation film thingy. And today the main topic is for the Cold War. An age of nuclear annihilation, fear of communism, the extremely eerie emergency broadcast system messages suddenly appearing on your television screens. But being quite a miserable subject and not wanting to dribble on about the Cold War material such as Korea, Vietnam, radioactive accumulated dosage and the chemistry of nuclear weapons I have decided to do a film related to this topic. But what is it? James Bond? No! Dr. Strangelove? No! East Germany and its love for nudity? Uh! 1983 nuclear war film The Day After. Well that's just happiness material isn't it? Uh! So in this review I will talk about the main plot of the film which revolves around the main characters, the other main plot, yeah there's another one, which revolves around the political events that results, <clears throat> spoiler alert, in nuclear annihilation. And finally, for we historians, the historical background and information about the background of the film. So, grab some popcorn, grab some tissues, and as always, enjoy. I don't want to set the world on fire. The main setting for this film revolves around the citizens of three cities of Lawrence, Kansas, and Kansas City in Missouri in the American Midwest. The film is split into two separate parts, pre-nukes and post-nukes, and will show the viewer the effects of nuclear warfare in terms of social, economic, environmental and political circumstances. The film follows five main characters, each one I will discuss individually. Dr. Russell Oakes, played by Jason Richards, is an upper class doctor who lives with his wife who works in downtown Kansas City Hospital. As he is about to teach hematology, whatever the hell that is, at the University of Kansas, the political situation begins to worsen, and en route to Kansas, the emergency broadcast system kicks in, forcing him to travel back to his wife, being the only motorist on the K-10 highway, which leads to Kansas City. The nukes drop, his car is disabled by an EMP, and is forced to walk all the way to Lawrence, which is 10 miles away from the destroyed Kansas. The entire city and most of its inhabitants were wiped out from the bomb, which I will discuss later, and also discuss the reason why and Oakes finally unites with his colleagues at the University Hospital and treat the remaining survivors, but slowly and surely the effects of radiation poison and overwork take their toll on Oakes. The other main character, Billy McCoy, is an airman first class of women in Kansas City and is called on duty during the DEFCON 2 alert from the worsening situation with the Soviets. Being a silo technician, he is the first witness to nuclear missile launches initiated for nuclear war. Realising this, his entourage of soldiers begin to panic and debate the best course of action. Stay at their posts and take shelter in the silos or flee as the silos are the main targets for the Soviets. McCoy tells them their jobs are done and speeds away in a stolen fifth truck to the town of Sedalia to get his wife and child. But the EMP prior to the actual bombage disables his truck and realising what is about to happen, flees and takes shelter in an overturned truck, barely escaping the nuclear blast. He emerges from the truck and walks to a nearby town and scavenges candy bar and gunfire in the air. Later, whilst in line for some water at the pump, he asks a man if Sedalia is still standing, but to his horror, the entire town is wiped out. He also befriends a mute man and shares his provisions. But, both succumb to radiation poison as they reach a hospital in the Farmer Jim Dahlberg and his family live in rural Harrison. <laughs> 37 miles from Kansas City, but live close to the family prepare for a wedding for their eldest daughter, Dylan. From an impending attack, Jim converts his basement into a fallout shelter. With the missiles are launched, he forcibly carries his senile wife to the shelter, who refuses to accept the reality of the situation. Does that a new explosion from their house? a nuclear explosion and is blinded. Another character then joins the farmer's story. Stephen Clyde. After hitchhiking, he stumbles across a farm and persuades Jim to let him in. After a few days, Denise gets distraught and runs outside into a field full of dead livestock. Seeing blue sky and believing the worst is over, the field is actually covered in nuclear fallout. Klein catches up and warns her about the dangers of the fallout. Though invisible, tasteless and intangible, it is going through her like X-ray. She ignores him and runs back inside the house. Because of her venture into a radioactive field, she slowly develops radiation poisoning. During a makeshift church sermon, she bleeds externally and is taken to Lawrence for treatment alongside Danny and Clyde, but the procedure is unsuccessful. Dahlberg, after returning from an emergency margin, uh, farmer's meeting, 
front squat and being shot dead. By the end of the film, Dr. Oakes develops lethal radiation poison and decides to return to his home before dying. Along his way, he sees the army and they begin execution looting. He reaches his now destroyed home and confronts a family of squatters. He angrily orders them to leave, but one silently offers him food, causing Oakes to collapse in despair as a member of the family confronts him. Whew, bloody hell. To put it in a simple nutshell, bombs go boom, cities blow up, people die slowly from an invisible force, and Jacks admit this is actually really f***ing depressing. Y'all a bit blue yet? No? Well let's talk some more about nuclear warfare. Yay! Throughout the film, prior to the nuclear exchange and aftermath of the war, we will hear news transmissions of the escalating crisis involving NATO and the Warsaw Pact. These are given to us through radio transmissions, TV reports, and so on. So here is the reason why nuclear warfare is unleashed onto the world in this movie. In East Germany, the Warsaw Pact emerges, commences a military build-up disguised as an exercise for the Western media, with goals of intimidating NATO to leave West Berlin. The US outright declines and the Soviet armor divisions are sent to the border. During the late hours of Friday the 15th, 1983, elements of the East German army rebel without Stasi intervention or something. In a response, the Soviet Union blockades West Berlin. Tensions obviously mount and the US issues an ultimatum to desist or face the non-compliance as an act of war. The Soviets outright refuse and all of NATO's forces are placed on high alert. On Saturday the 16th, NATO invades East Germany through the Helmstedt checkpoint. Wait, hang on a frickin' minute. NATO forces at the time in West Germany were around 1,084,200 soldiers, plus an extra reserve of 500,000 in France. The Soviets alone have like 1,060,000, plus an extra 480,000 in the Balkans and Austria, plus another 2,900,000 personnel in the USSR. Well, there is one word to describe the strategy and lack of intelligence on the Soviet army. Shit. Anyway, the attack fails and NATO receives heavy casualties, obviously. Two MiG 25s are crossing the western German airspace and bomb NATO munition storage facilities alongside a school and hospital. Causing radio transmissions, Moscow is hurriedly evacuated and with a response, the US and the Soviet Union evacuated major cities. Nuclear weapons were used in Weisbach and Frankfurt and in the Berlin Gulf. Naval warfare erupts and heavy casualties are gained on both sides. Eventually, the Soviet army reaches the Rhine, and to prevent the Soviets invading France, NATO airbursts three low-yield MTWs, tactical nuclear weapons, over advancing Soviet troops. The Soviets counterattack by launching nuclear weapons into Brussels on the NATO headquarters. In response, the 52 bombers of the Strategic Air Command are scrambled. Oh sh! Yeah. Soviet Air Force then destroyed the BM induction stations in Ar in Ariane Plain Airfields in Georgia, Field Air Force Base in California. The US finally launched a full nuclear strike against the Soviet Union, and simultaneously the Soviets fired 300 ICBMs and 37,010 impacting points. Most of the missiles aimed at America and in the Midwest by 3:38 p.m. Mostly due to being a strategic nuclear reserve leave the central U.S. state as a lifeless wasteland full of the dead, dying and ready to the city. But amazingly in the film, a ceasefire is announced between NATO and the Warsaw Pact forces, and the U.S. vows to never surrender to the USSR. Anyways, simply to put it, things go to hell more quickly than you can say, oh f hell. Phew, that took some time. Now it's time to talk about the historical facts of the film. Nearly done now, so don't get too peed off, alright? I... Being a film directed in 1983, you think that many historical events during the day may have influenced the plot of the movie, despite the fact nuclear holocaust films were quite the norm during the late 20th century. Not only was this, was this film influenced by events during 1983, but this film also changed the political viewpoint on nuclear war and relations with the USSR until its collapse. So what event influenced the film's main plot, concept and consequences? Three words, Able Archer 1983. What was this Able Archer 1983? It was a 10 day NATO military exercise which started on November 2nd, 1983, 
which spanned the entire Western European theatre, centred from NATO headquarters, France. Naval Arch exercises were a common US NATO military exercise during the Cold War, simulating the DEFCON 1 nuclear attack scenario. What made the 1983 exercise more dubious and terrifying was newly implemented features such as new coded communication, radio silence and the involvement of, with the heads of state. With this exercise set in an almost realistic nature and worsening its relations with the USSR, also came the anticipated arrival of the new American Pershing II missiles into Europe. So of course, to many a member of the Soviet government, they saw this as a ruse for war. Preparations for war were made, nuclear forces were ready, and air units in East Germany and Poland were on high alert. The threat of war subsided, thankfully, with the end of the exercises on November 11th. But to top this off, various other incidences almost led to war in 1983. Operation Riot, the largest intelligence gathering operation in Soviet history on nuclear warfare, after bluntly announcing that the USA was preparing for a nuclear attack on the USSR, PSYOP, or Psychological Operations from 1981 to 1983, a series of highly clandestine operations into the highly disputed GIUK gap between Iceland and Britain, the shooting down of Korea Airlines Flight 007 by Soviet interceptors worth the Sakhalin Island, which led to the death of a prominent anti communist in the US Senate, Larry McDonald, the weapons build up caused by Ronald Reagan's bellicose policies towards the Soviet Union, which would leave Marxism and Leninism on the heap of the building of a strategic defense initiative, all known as the Star Wars Project, a satellite defense mechanism, and finally, and more terrifyingly, the Soviet nuclear false alarm incident, which was caused by an alignment of sunlight and clouds over the satellite's orbit. But the early year 1983 might as well have been labeled the Year of the Brown Trousers, or DEFCON Brown. But now, the change of political attitudes towards the Soviet Union and nuclear warfare by this film alone. By 1983, Ronald Reagan, the 40th President of America at the time, and the well-known actor in his more youthful days, was known for, in his early years as President, for his fiery anti-communist viewpoints. In 1982, for example, addressing the British Parliament, he said Marxism and Leninism would be a heap of ash by the march of freedom and democracy. He labelled the accidental KAL-007 incident as a massacre, even though it was an accident. He labelled the USSR an evil empire at an evangelical assembly, boycotted the Moscow 1980 Olympics over the USSR intervention in Afghanistan, and supplied the Mujahideen. We all know how well that went. A very aggressive policy in many modern people's eyes. But when Reagan was introduced to this film just before it aired on November 5th, 1983, he suddenly had a change of heart, sort of. An epiphany, if you will. He came out of the film as very effective and left me greatly depressed. Four years later, he was showing them the film. He and Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, and he began friendlier relations with the USSR. Also in 1987, the film was aired in the USSR as part of Gorbachev, Glasnost, and Perestroika policy. Oh, and one more quick fact about this film. When this film was aired on November 20th, 1983, on the ABC television network, over 100 million people saw this program when it was broadcast. It remains today the highest rated television film in history. No advertisements were aired after the nuclear attack scenes and many 1-800 hotlines were opened and on standby just for that alone. Various candle individuals took place all over the American Midwest where the film was recorded. And finally, the film received 12 Emmy nominations and won two of them. And so it wraps up this video. I hope I didn't make you too blue with this topic, but it is interesting to talk about it nonetheless. If you're interested in any other nuclear war films, I will I'll subscribe to you a few suggestions. Where the Wind Blows, War Game, and Threads. But I must warn you, Threads is not for the squeamish of people. So until next time, farewell and see you soon. Homer JT, signing out. Are all alone.